Okay, so continuing with two-dimensional kinematics, uh, today's lesson is about projectile motion. So baseballs, tennis balls, Olympic divers, uh, all ex exhibit <coughs> projectile motion. A projectile is an object that moves around in two dimensions under the influence only of gravity. So we neglect things like air resistance or you know there can't be any strings attached or anything like that. So this extends freefall motion. It's similar to freefall motion uh, in that it's accelerating downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. But in general, there can be a horizontal component of the velocity. As I said, air resistance is neglected. So things that fly, like a paper airplane or something, are not uh, projectiles by this definition. So projectiles follow a parabolic trajectory. So here is a uh, sort of a stop frame um, a motion diagram of the motion of a tennis ball is bouncing and in between bounces when it's actually bouncing uh, it's no longer a projectile because there's another force the force from uh, the floor on the ball but in between bounces the only thing acting on the ball is gravity and uh, the motion follows this uh, curved line called a parabola so here's uh, here's a picture of a guy kicking a soccer ball after the kick so after the ball has left the person's foot then the only force on the ball is just gravity and this uh, red line is the parabolic path uh, s is the displacement uh, at the at this point and we define the y-axis to be up and uh, you know positive y up and the x-axis to be horizontal so what we do is we break the motion into uh, into two components. So the velocity, we decompose that into the x component of the velocity and the y component. And you can see these the purple arrows here are what's showing the actual velocity of the projectile. And then the, the two dashed arrows that are perpendicular are the components. So you add these, uh, the blue plus the red equals the purple. So looking at this, the blue arrows are all the same length. So actually the horizontal motion uh, has zero acceleration. So the x component of the acceleration is zero. So this v sub x is always constant. So this is a <coughs> property of projectiles is that whatever initial speed they have or a component of their velocity along, uh, the, along x is constant throughout the motion. Whereas the vertical component, I'll uh, just look up at that, that does the same thing that we talked about in, in free fall. So if something was uh, thrown directly up, the velocity would decrease by 9.8 meters per second every second until it got to its maximum, and at which point the y component goes to zero, uh, y component of the velocity goes to zero, and then uh, the y component of the velocity goes negative and becomes more and more negative as it falls. And when you combine those two things, uh, you get x and y uh, motions are recombined to give the total velocity or the <coughs> just the actual velocity at any point on the trajectory which looks like this so the the x component is always the same the y component just does uh, this thing of going it's positive at first it decreases decreases until the y component is zero at the top and then it in, you know becomes more and more negative so let's give it a try here is a parabolic path of a tennis ball which is launched at some initial angle and it flies between points a b and c so you know we neglect the or i guess point a is just after it's been hit and c is just before it hits maybe the the ground or the net or something like that so at point b up here is the velocity zero okay. is the velocity horizontal is the velocity vertical D is the velocity up and to the right, or E is the velocity down and to the right. So please pause the video, think about it, and then resume. So hopefully you figured out that the velocity at point B is purely horizontal. So remember the vertical component of the velocity is zero at this maximum height. But the horizontal component is constant throughout the motion. It doesn't actually change. So just what happens at B is that there's nothing but a horizontal component so it's on the way between a and b it's up and to the right between b and c it's down and to the right but at b it's it, the velocity is directly towards the right okay so let's took, take a look at the equations for projectile motion so when you're problem solving 
uh, for kinematics, you have the equations of constant acceleration, if you know the acceleration is constant, and in a projectile motion, when you neglect air resistance, the acceleration is constant. It's 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. So if you define x to be horizontal and y to be vertical upwards, you have a sub x equals 0, and a sub y is negative g, so it's negative 9.8 meters per second squared, where g, I guess, is just defined to be the constant uh, 9.8. So g is positive, but negative g is, is the negative 9.8. So uh, the equations look like this. So horizontally, if the acceleration is 0, there's really only two equations uh, for zero acceleration. The first is is that the x position equals the initial x position plus v times t and the other, it's not really an equation, but you just note that v sub x is constant. This is, so the final velocity in the x is the same as the initial velocity. But for the y component, the acceleration is negative g, so you have these four equations of constant acceleration where in each case we've replaced uh, a sub y with negative uh, g. So you can now combine these and the common variable between the horizontal component and the vertical components is time. The t is the same uh, in all of these equations, or in the vertical as well as the, the horizontal. So <clears throat> let's give it a try here. A bullet is fired horizontally at the same moment that another bullet is dropped from rest. Both bullets begin at the same height above the ground. Which bullet hits the ground first? The A, the bullet that was fired horizontally, B, the bullet which was dropped from rest, or C, they both hit the ground at the same time. Please think about that for a moment, and pause the video, and then uh, resume. So hopefully you figured out that they both would actually hit the ground at the same time. So this is the same idea of splitting uh, the velocity into two different components. So as you know, if you just release something from rest, it falls downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. If something is fired with an initial velocity towards the right, horizontally, the initial y component of its velocity is zero. So the, the y component of the motion falls down with this 9.8 meters per second squared, and the y distance that it travels is going to be the same as the y distance it travels if there was no horizontal component. So the horizontal and the vertical components are totally separate. Okay, let's do a worked example on range. A cannonball is fired with an initial speed v sub zero at an angle theta sub zero above horizontal. How far does the cannonball travel horizontally before it returns back to the same height? Okay, so we can draw the initial velocity right there. Uh, there's horizontal and there's your angle theta sub zero above horizontal. There's the trajectory. We want to find the range, which I'm going to call r, the distance it travels horizontally. We set the initial position to be zero, x sub zero zero, y sub zero zero. It starts at the origin. The final position will be when it goes the distance r in the range, and actually the final y position is equal to the initial, uh, which is zero. And initially, sine. If we look at the initial velocity and the little uh, right angle triangle, sine theta sub zero is v sub zero y over v sub zero. We can solve for the y component of the initial velocity is v zero sine theta, and the horizontal component is v zero cos theta. So let's start with the y component. What do we know? Well, we know that its, start, its initial and final positions are the same, and then accelerating with minus g. And we know that t is important because it is the same for both the, for the x and the y components. And the variable here that's not important is v final. I know I've written y final there, but I mean the final velocity. So uh, of the equations of constant acceleration, the one that does not have final velocity in it is the one that we're going to choose uh, for our y component. So that is y final, y initial, uh, v zero t minus one half g t squared. So we solve that out. Uh, y final minus y zero is that on the right. Uh, y final minus y zero is zero. The initial y velocity is v zero sine theta. So uh, we can rearrange. We get v zero sine theta times t uh, equals one half g t squared. If we assume that t does not equal zero, then we can divide both sides by t. 
And then we just get that v0 sine theta equals 1 half g times t. Solve that for t, and we get t equals uh, 2 v0 t sine theta over g. Okay, so let's go to the x component. The x component equation is simple. We just use x final as x initial plus v sub x times t, uh, where uh, vx uh, is just the initial, which is v0 cos theta. x final is r, uh, y initial, x initial is 0. So r equals v0 cos theta times t. And we'll take t from our y component and plug it into our x component now. So we get v0 cos theta times what we got from the y. If we combine all of those things together, we get 2v squared cos theta sine theta over g. And we can leave it like that, or we can look at our trigonometry textbook and use the double angle formula uh, from trigonometry, which says sine 2 theta is 2 times sine theta cos theta. So comparing equations there, we've got r is v squared over g times 2 cos theta sine theta. That is r equals v squared uh, times sine 2 theta over g. And that is the equation that we will be using for, for range. So we've just in the example figured out what we call the range. So the range is the distance that an object tra a projectile travels until it comes back to the same vertical height. And here's the equation that we found. And uh, if you keep theta sub zero constant, so fire them all at the same angle in this uh, diagram, just 45 degrees, as you change the initial speed, as you increase the initial speed, it goes further. Okay, so uh, here at the red line is initial speed 30 meters per second, purple 40 meters per second, uh, the green is 50 meters per second. It goes further and further the faster the initial speed. Um, if you keep the initial speed constant but vary the angle, you'll find actually that if theta sub zero is zero, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, you have to have a little bit of, uh, you have to have the initial angle above above zero. And then the range increases and, until theta sub zero equals 45 degrees. That's the maximum range. Then if you increase theta sub zero above 45, it goes up and down and the range is decreased until if you go all the way to 90 degrees, it just goes up and down and the range is zero again. So keep in mind, when we did this, when we derived this equation for range, we assumed uh, that the Earth is flat and the ground is flat and the Earth is not curved, I guess. So when we speak of the range of a projectile on level ground, we assume that the range, R, is very small compared with the circumference of the Earth. But in reality, if the range is very large, the Earth would curve away from the projectile uh, and actually the acceleration of gravity would change direction to be towards the center of the Earth. So if this dashed line is maybe what we assume is being flat, the actual range would be larger than predicted by the range equation due to this curvature of the Earth. So if we look more, uh, sort of stand back from that, we can see that if we really increase the initial velocity enough and launch something horizontally from a height, it might continue going all the way, all the way around and hit you in the back of the head. So if the initial speed is great enough, the Earth curves away from underneath the object at the same rate as it falls. So from the object's point of view, it's always the same height above the surface of the Earth. It falls continuously, but never hits the surface. This is what we call an orbit. And of course, in order to uh, make this work, you have to neglect air resistance. And the only way to do that is to go up into space high enough so that you're above the Earth's atmosphere, which actually is only about, if you go about 500 kilometers up, that's far enough. And this is called orbit. This is exactly how satellites orbit the Earth. They are projectiles, uh, which are always falling, but always at the same height above the Earth.